Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, first supporter here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, we're a webinar, a webcast, an online show. Um, the terminology in some, in some um, areas is up for debate. Um, but whatever you want to call us, we are here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show and it is posted to our website every week. Um, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can go and see all of those recordings. Um, both the live show and our recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please do share with your um, colleagues, uh, friends, neighbors, family, anybody who you think might be interested in any of our um, topics that we have. Um, and they can register for our upcoming shows or watch any of our previous shows. Encompass Live has been around since January 2009, so we have a lot of um, items in our archives. Um, we are librarians, so we do save everything. <laughs> so um, our archives do go back that far, so do be aware when you do look at them, there are there could be some um, out-of-date things, um, uh, topics that have already seemed to be not you know, up to speed, but um, they're there for historical purposes, of course. Um, we do a mixture of things here on the show, book reviews, interviews, many training sessions, demos of services and products. Really the only criteria we have is that it is something library related, something libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing, something new they might be interested in. Um, some of our topics, you may look at a title and say, what, what does that have to do with libraries? But trust me, I do make sure everything has to do with libraries ultimately. Um, we do have um, library commission staff that sometimes come on and do shows for us for things that the library commission here in Nebraska is doing um, for our libraries. But we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning. To my left here is Andrew Cano, who is from, well, he's a couple of different things. Yes. He's from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Um, Lincoln Libraries, which is right up the street from us yes. here in Lincoln, but he is also our incoming NLA, Nebraska Library Association, for those of you not from Nebraska, um, president-elect, so wearing two hats. Yes, that I am. <laughs> That's important. Um, and uh, Andrew's going to talk, he's been in the library field for, for a while. Yeah, 13 years. 13 years. Yeah. yeah, so he's going to talk about um, tips for early career success and things that you can do um, for yourself. So I will just hand over control to you and you can go ahead and take it away with your talk. Hi, good morning everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, I don't know if you saw the graphic there at the beginning, uh, but it was supposed to be kind of a fuzzy image that came into focus, uh, kind of like a little gimmicky thing I had. <laughs> uh, just to kind of make my point uh, that sometimes as we navigate our careers, uh, we really can't see what's going on. Our careers tend to be out of focus and when things are out of focus, I mean, it really is kind of like hiking in the woods. You have your eyes closed, you have your arms in front of you, you're hoping for the best, you're hoping you don't fall off a cliff, and that you ultimately get to your destination. And again, I think that's just an apt metaphor uh, for how some of us in the early stages of our careers feel. Uh, so my presentation today is called Finding Your Focus uh, because I really want you to realize that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to things. I'm going to give very, very general advice here, maybe some general tips gleaned from experience, uh, and I'm really hoping to have enough time at the end uh, for questions. Uh, given the format of this uh, presentation, I'm just going to go through this. If you have questions, just type them in, and we'll get to them at the beginning. Usually, I like to interact with the members as I'm presenting, and I, I gave a version of this a few months ago to NLA, but given our format, uh, again, just type in your questions and I'll get to them. And again, I'm hoping to go through this maybe in a half hour if I'm lucky, uh, giving us 20 minutes or so for a, a good uh, amount of question and answers. Yeah, feel free to type in anytime you want. I'm totally willing to interrupt. No, okay. Yeah, easy, and I'm willing to be interrupted. Same thing, if I'm like making weird eye contact because I really have no idea where I'm looking at with this camera or I'm <laughs> yelling at you because I don't know how to modulate my voice with this microphone, now uh, feel free. Uh, to give that a kind of a co cosmetic feedback, and I'll make adjustments as well. So a little bit about me. Uh, usually on this slide, I'll, I'll spend a little time talking about each of my jobs and where I've been. Uh, in the interest of time, and because there are almost 40 people signed up for this, I don't know how many will end up attending alive, uh, but I do, you know, in case more people come in, uh, I do want to have time for Q&A. 
I'm just going to say that suffice it to say, over 13 years, I've been in several places. So uh, these are kind of my six uh, employers. And that starts with as a work study student. So to kind of talk about the bookends here, uh, I was a work study student at the Pacific College Josephine. Uh, that's kind of a mouthful. It was at Omen Columbus, Ohio, a theological seminary. And that's what introduced me to the library world. I honestly, if it wasn't for that experience, uh, I would not have ended up being you know, a librarian like I am now. And then on the other end is the Nebraska Libraries, which is where I'm at now as an assistant professor, virtual learning librarian. And I, I, in the four in between, kind of I bounced around a little bit, moved in different places. Uh, I know that a couple of you are from Dallas, if you're here. Uh, Strayer with the North Dallas campus off of uh, Coit and 635, if you know where that is. I used to live downtown Dallas, love the downtown uh, main library. So if, you, if you're here, kudos to you for having a, a wonderful library system there in Dallas. And then I saw one person from Tarleton, again, don't know if you're here. But when I was at uh, McLennan Community College, uh, we do have a branch of Tarleton, a satellite campus. Uh, so I did work with some uh, Tarleton personnel and uh, working in the library there. We had a lot of Tarleton students that, that we serve. So again, so I'm, I'm enjoying seeing the uh, sign up sheet and seeing some connections there. But ultimately, going back to the main point, I held several jobs as a paraprofessional, as uh, an academic librarian, as an adjunct uh, librarian, and also uh, in a paraprofessional role. So this some administrative stuff. And it, it gave me a lot of good experiences. And that's uh, what I'm going to share with you today. It gave me a lot of insights into different things. But at the same time, it also provided a lot of instability. So <laughs> yeah. you know, looking back on it, I can connect the dots and, and see how everything kind of played out. And I learned from things. But at that time when I was there, I didn't know where things were going. And I just really made mistakes. So the theme of today's presentation is really what I wish someone had told me when I was early. Uh, library yeah. for Charlton is here. Oh, perfect. Great. Abby, is it uh, Allie Warren? Allie yes. Warren. Nice to see you there. <laughs> Stephenville is wonderful. I actually, I love those small type of schools. So you work at a fantastic place and mm -hmm. I actually really miss Texas. I, I, I love mm -hmm. a lot of things about Texas. So, um, and it's actually as hot here as it is there, believe it or not. It is going to be. Yes. Yeah. I think we're yeah. shooting for 103 by Friday or something. Crazy like that. Yeah. I, think, I yeah. like here. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Many people, when they go into libraries, they kind of focus on one type of library to work in. Yeah. And it's nice to see that mm -hmm. you don't have to do that, though. You can. Yeah. I mean, you were public library, community college. That's university, correct. Big university. I mean, it, yeah. it can, it's okay. That's it. That's correct. It, it is that's okay. A good, a good lesson is it's okay to have this kind of. A <laughs> exactly. It's it's it, it, yeah. And I'll come back to that point, but it is good to have a nonlinear path because it really gives you appreciation for what other people do. So, for example, with my putting on my NLA hat, uh, I know what paraprofessionals go through. We have a you know very active paraprofessional yeah. section, mm -hmm. and I you know being a, having started as a paraprofessional doing librarian work uh, at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. I can, I can appreciate them. And then at the, at the universities, I got to do a lot of non-library work. So know what admissions go through, I know what registrars go through, what professors go through, and that helps me do my job at UNL. Uh, but again, uh, wouldn't have been the path I chose, but it was the path that I walked, and I'm glad to be here, because I know one thing, if anything had gone different, I wouldn't be right here in this room talking to you, and that's where I want to be right now. So enough about me. Here's my first tip. Ooh, my, there's a typo up there. Okay, uh, apologies oh. for that typo. That's on me. Um, huh, interesting, that's unlike me. Anyway, so my first tip is set your goals. And, I, and there's a wonderful quote I found from uh, Yogi Berra there. Yogi yeah, if you don't know where you're, you're going, you'll, also, you'll end up someplace else. And that quote is so perfect for me. Now, that someplace else ends up being a good place to be. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes you end up going somewhere you don't or you, you end up having to start over. And that can be a very, very frustrating experience. So one thing I wish I had done, and I would go back to library school and do this, is really just set my goals of what it is that I wanted to be. I just went to library school. I really didn't know all the different kind of career paths that there are in the library world. I didn't know the specific skills uh, required for specific jobs. And in hindsight, I probably should have waited another year or two to, to uh, kind of learn about that before going to library school. And one piece of advice I would give is find a job that you really want, and preferably a job that you're not qualified for. You know, you can look at the job listings, look at ALA job list, look at the NLC job postings, you know, look at higher ed jobs if you're in higher ed. But look around, try to find a job that's maybe two or three levels above you 
you don't have the experience for it, you don't have the degree possibly, uh, you don't have the skills, you know, maybe three years of a supervisory experience, that kind of stuff, or you know, managing particular databases. And, and just look at that job description and start jotting down what they're looking for. You know, jot down the skills that you need, the years of experience, and then using kind of the principles of design thinking, work backwards and try to establish steps to get to those goals. So if you need three to five years of supervisory experience, well, you need a three to five years of supervisory experience. So try to get yourself in a position to get into that supervisory position. So let's say you want to be a library director. Well, that supervisory experience is probably going to start as a team leader, maybe as an assistant manager, uh, you know, something, whatever it is that your institution calls it, just that entry level management. And then you find out, well, what do I do to get into that entry level management? Maybe six months of experience there. Maybe you need a proven record uh, in, in a particular skill set. So again, you can see what I'm doing. You're working backwards. And as you start working backwards, you can create the little goals, the little individual steps you need uh, to get to that next step. Also, uh, some of those steps may require you know, more, more education. You may need an advanced degree. If you're in higher ed, you know you probably need a doctorate for a lot of jobs nowadays. At the very least, you may need a second master's degree if you don't have one already. So you need to make a plan, hey, I need, I need this degree. Sometimes it's not negotiable, you need this other degree. So you go ahead and you make goals, okay, which school can I go to? Uh, do I get tuition or admission at my current institution? Is there any kind of tuition discount based on my ALA membership or your state library association that, you know, any programs that you can go to? Um, if you need just particular skills, let's just say you need coding experience and uh, let's just go ahead and say C++. You may not necessarily have to go to school for that. You may be able to find you know, Code Academy, Code School, Khan Academy, other you know, avenues through which to develop those skills. Either way, I don't want to get bogged down with too many specific examples. The plan is create those goals and then create a roadmap for how to get to those goals. And be prepared to maybe have to compromise a little bit and say, you know what, because of my family, because of my geographic location, whatever reasons there are, you may end up realizing, you know, I'm just not going to be able to do that. I may not have time to invest in six to eight years on a doctorate degree if I go part time, and then adjust your goals accordingly. Okay, Ooh, you shouldn't have done that. I, this uh, mouse is a little sensitive, but you can all enjoy my cat there. <laughs> Tip two, that's and that's kind of the next point is identify those gaps, and that's what I was just speaking about is you know finding out what it is you have and finding out what it is you don't have. You're taking an inventory of your own skills and degrees, credentials, et cetera, and, and you try to figure out how to fill them. Uh, again, it might be going back to school, it might be uh, taking a free MOOC or free class, it may just be going to work extra early and working 10 hours in an eight, you know, for an eight hour shift because you need that extra hour at the beginning and end of your day uh, to just kind of develop those experiences. It might be, you know, shadowing another professional, it might be uh, meeting with other people, it might be just sitting back and observing. There's a lot of value to that, just sitting back and, and observing. I know one thing I actually did right was when I was in the Metropolitan Library System, I would work in other branches. I would, on Sundays, we were allowed to trade shifts at the time, and I would go to different branches to see different size, uh, different types of patrons, uh, just different experience all the way from small neighborhood uh, libraries and very poor communities to very affluent ones. Whole different types of patrons and I got to see uh, the kind of people I would want to serve and the kind of uh, skills I want to develop and, and that helped me really uh, identify my own gaps and, and develop them. Same thing here when I'm at the university, I have a lot of gaps. Uh, you know, I was hired for, but sometimes you, you, you realize those gaps and you get hired for a job. You know, believe it or not, I know some of you would be shocked, Library school doesn't prepare you for everything. Uh, and you just have to, to again, look back and say, man, I should have taken that elective or maybe you should have paid more attention on this week, but you didn't. So you got to focus on where you're at and again, and just fill that very quickly and create a plan for yourself. And one person that can help you do that a lot is a mentor. And if there's any big takeaway from today's presentation, you just do not remember anything else, is to just find a mentor. You know, look through your state associations. I will plug at NLA, the new member roundtable is creating a program. Uh, I would, mentorship yeah, program, the new, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I would recommend that, you know, if you're not, even if you're not a member of NMRT to, to you know, contact us and reach out. My contact info will be at the end of this email, uh, at the end of the slide. Um, so just email me and I can get you in touch with the right people. Go to our website. If you're not in Nebraska, uh, maybe look at your state association and just, just look around and it could just be finding somebody at your own work. Because a mentor will guide you, 
We'll help you uh, realize what's realistic, what's not. We'll give you practical advice because not everything is written down. Uh, there's the way things uh, should work and the way things do work, and sometimes there's, there's a gap in between it. And you know, sometimes it really is just a matter of whose hands you've shaken and who you've met and where you happen to be, and a mentor can help you kind of navigate those waters. Uh, my advice for a mentor is one, even if you have different mentors, or kind of with lowercase m, I have several people I work with. One works with me on my research skills, and another one works with me on my people skills, which I need sometimes, some days. And another one works with me a little bit on, on some of the technical stuff that I'm working at right now. I'm working with some you know, high-end uh, technology and stuff that I just wasn't familiar with. Uh, but you'd have kind of like a case manager, so to speak, a big capital M mentor, the person who can really meet with you and give you that advice, and and ideally it's somebody who's in a position that you want, at least two levels above you. So you know, look at your organizational chart, and you want to find somebody who's in a position at least two levels above you, not too high. You don't, you know, if you're first year in a public library, you may not want to talk to the chair of the board or, or the director at this stage. And think with me, I probably don't want to have my dean as my mentor at this point. Uh, maybe down the road. But you, you know, it's something that you can be in the next five to ten years. You can be in that position. But uh, that being said, I gave the example of my dean. You really don't want that person in your chain of command. Uh, that introduces a different dynamic. And if that person is, you know, is in any way making decisions about your future, you're not going to be able to speak freely to that. You really, you know, for those with a Catholic background, you almost want like a spiritual director, or confessor. You know, you want somebody you can share things with professionally, uh, preferably, uh, but someone who can just give you candid advice. And again, if, if they're making decisions about you, uh, there's just no way someone can unremember something. Uh, sometimes that's not possible. If you're in a small rural community, uh, that's unavoidable. But I would say, you know, you, you kind of negotiate the boundaries at the beginning so you know what's appropriate and what's not. Uh, when you look for a mentor, sometimes you don't hit a home run the first time. It's like a therapist or a dentist or you know, any other personal trainer, any other kind of profession like that. You may end up finding the wrong one. And I will warn you <laughs> that the, a bad you mentor. You don't realize it at first. Exactly. You don't realize it at first, but before you know it, you're being given advice, not, given bad advice, excuse me, not because the person is anyway evil or malicious but just because there's a mismatch going on there. There's just for whatever reason, like I said, I, I think a personal trainer is a great example. It just, it's, just not, it's just not working out uh, for whatever reason. It might be you, it might be him or her, but it's somebody and this isn't working out and you're all professionals at the end of the day and it's time to say, look, I need to find a good mentor. You don't want to stick with somebody just because you want to save face and not be embarrassed because again, you, you, it may take you years to recover uh, from the bad advice. Hopefully you'll end up in a lava pit and with artificial lamps <laughs> and become the dark lord not of the universe. In not, so. not in libraries. No, yeah. that's that's a safe bet that you won't go that far. Um, it's, I like the part, um, whenever I was always thought about doing mentorship, that yeah. it's always, how do I find the right person yeah. who's the one for me? Yeah. But when you mentioned there could be more than one person, yes. I never really thought about that. There's not. I mean, I've always thought about how do I, how do I, if I'm, if I am the mentor, be the the one person yeah. for everything this person needs that has with libraries. I don't know everything about all the different yeah. things they might be doing, and the other way around. How do I find the one person that can mentor me? But it doesn't have to be. You might yeah. end up with multiple that's ones correct. because certain people have certain strengths. That, that's absolutely correct. And it, just to talk, you know, focus that on makes yeah. a lot less pressure. Exactly. <laughs> on sides. And just to focus on me, like I do have one person who's technically lateral to me. Uh, she's got more years of experience, but she's she's lateral to me in terms of position. And she gives me a lot of really good advice uh, in terms of how to do my job. You know, it really in, at the university level, it takes a couple of years to really figure out what way is north on some days. And so she's helped me a lot with uh, with some of my, uh, we have teaching, research, and, and service uh, at the university academic level. So she helps me with my teaching and how to do my job a little bit better, manage my time a little bit better. Um, and then my big mentor just kind of keeps checking on me. Okay, well, did you talk to so-and-so about this? And the like, and you know, he and I meet every couple of months. And he, he is my, my mentor on research. But that's just coincidence. So yeah, I would say the standards for the small lowercase m mentor are lower. It could be a colleague, it could be somebody in another department, it could be somebody with a job that you have no intention of doing, but someone who in some way, shape, or form is helping you, especially if it's an experienced person 
uh, who's been around for a few decades and again knows how things really work, which is not always in the manual. Just someone who knows what's going exactly. on, even if they're yeah. your, your um, email yeah. colleague. Exactly. And, and I, I listed these tips in order just to say it's kind of sequ uh, sequential because you can't find a mentor until you really know what your what your goals are and what those gaps are because that's really what's going to – it's kind of like, again, to, to go to a therapist example, if you go see a therapist and they ask you, well, why are you here? And you say, well, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's just off to a bad start. But if you say I have this diagnosis or I have this behavior and I have these things I want to work on, now the therapist can give you specific advice. And the therapist may say, well, I'm sorry, I don't treat people with X. You need to see, you know, here's a referral. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a mentor. A mentor can say, you know what, I'm not the right person for you, but I think this other person could. So it's just a win-win situation when you know that. And that leads to my, you know, I sent you the wrong one. I updated mm -hmm. all this, but I went from tip to step. I guess I'm so I apologize for that. I will make sure that I, this is a recording, but if any of you want these slides, I will make sure I send you the ones that I had updated, which I apparently did not attach to this email. But tip four, not step four, is stick to the plan. So at this point, if you're if you're following, I guess the Andrew Cannell model, you set your goals, you've identified gaps, you find a, a mentor who's going to help you uh, fill those gaps, and and so you have a plan. You've had, you've formed a plan at this point. Stick to it. This was my biggest mistake over the last 13 years is as soon as things didn't go right, and I'm talking six months later, I'm a very old millennial, so I could probably best categorize myself, because as, as soon as things didn't go right, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to switch gears and go to another direction. And patience truly is a virtue. It's going to take years to see the fruit of some of your efforts, and you have to be willing to invest those, those years. Uh, I'm not saying you don't switch positions. I'm not saying obviously you don't accept a promotion or maybe realize, hey, I am miserable in this job and I have to leave it. I'm just saying you, you need to stick to it. Again, it's like exercise. It's just it's going to take a while. You got to do it every day. And three years down the road, you'll finally look at your biceps and say, oh, wow, that paid off. Uh, so it's the same thing with, with the plan. So stick to it. That being said, my final tip is be flexible. Life will happen. Let me repeat that. Life will happen. You will realize that the person you are at 30 was not the person you were at 22. Uh, the person you were at 40 was not the person you were at 30. You will have kids. You will marry. You will, you will move. Um, the job will change on you. you know, they will bring in a new robot and say, okay, this person, you know, this robot will now do the job of the five of you. Things will happen. You know, those of us who have been in the library field for even a few years know the job has completely changed. So again, life will happen, so you have to be flexible, and that's why it's really good to develop skills that are transferable to different areas. Uh, you, you always want to look for professional development opportunities. You always want to develop skills. Kind of have an exit plan is kind of uh, a, maybe a way to capture this. If you needed to just change gears and turn, uh, you know, uh, and, and turn on a dime, you have to be uh, ready for that. Uh, and just to just according to if you've been, you know, if you've been following the other tips you will be in a good position to do that because you'll, again, you'll have those skills that you can market to other employers or, you know, maybe talk to your supervisor and say, uh, maybe I can shift over to this department. Maybe you're in cataloging and you want to shift over uh, maybe to archives and you can say, I bring in these skills that are transferable. So again, have that plan and be flexible. So with all that, here's my contact info. Again, as I mentioned, you can email me. I will send you the uh, slides that fix those typos because I'm, not happy about them, kind of OCD <laughs> about those, those things. Okay, you can send yeah. them the correct ones. Okay, and I'll send them. I'll put them up with them. Great, fantastic. I'll send them to Krista. I'll get the new ones. Great. Yeah. Uh, and no sure, sure. And that's my personal information. So if you want to, you know, just reach out to me, uh, either to talk about NLA, that mentoring that I mentioned, or if you want to talk about maybe getting something started in your library association, or want me to expand upon anything, uh, let me know. But we have, I, I made it. I somehow did it. Uh, we have plenty of time left. Here and how many are in the room right now? Eleven. Okay. 12? Yeah. Okay. There's twelve here. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot more signed up, but that's even better for you because honestly, each of you has about two minutes of questions that you're allowed to have. So please don't be shy. I'm just going to sit here and awkwardly look at the camera until you ask a question. So let's so, so shoot. I was trying to find here myself. Yeah. So please do type in the question section of your GoToWebinar interface. Any questions you have? Anything you want to know more about? Um, anything you're curious about and what you're doing in your career, if you're looking for any tips of what you can do. And I was trying to see, 
if I can find. Yeah, I don't know if they'll have it up there. Here's just... something, yes. Okay. About the, our new members okay. roundtable piloting a yeah, mentoring it, program. The information she's going to bring it up. The information is on Facebook, which I do not use, mm -hmm. so I have no idea. I have no idea what's on NLA's Facebook. Uh, oh, this maybe, is yeah. new member roundtables on Facebook. Oh, oh, okay. Even see it's the exclusive Actually. NMRT roundtable. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Again, and if you are in Nebraska, uh, we have our conference in October, and there will be a presentation on this mentoring program as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Terry Rickle great. will be presenting on mentorship and leadership, and the committee uh, that's in charge of this, the roundtable members, will be answering questions. And you're, you're going to hear a lot more about that. But again, even if you're not in Nebraska, I would encourage you to, to look uh, for it. ALA offers a little bit. I'm in the special program at ALA, and now I'm, I'm now a mentor. I'm, I'm that old now that I... I've become a mentor to a fresh, uh, young library school graduate. Actually, I was I was a little too um, optimistic in my googling. Okay. Which I did an NMRT mentor, assuming okay. I'm here in Nebraska. That's oh sure, yeah. And it came with ALA's mentoring program. Okay. So, okay. okay. Well, that's a good question. So the ALA <laughs> NMRT, the New Members Roundtable, does there offer mentoring. Yeah. So again, there's plenty of opportunities, and again, it, and it could just be a matter of even your employer. Offering mentors, there, you know, there's there's all kinds of avenues. Yeah. I have a, yeah, here's another sure. program. Yeah. I have a question about because I've a lot of people have talked about getting a mentor and having mm -hmm. someone official, and I've never okay mm -hmm. never officially been a mentor yeah. to someone as far as I know as for and never asked anyone. And that's the part that I have trouble with is the yeah. ask like sure. how how do you ask someone to do something that Make that that like an yeah. official thing because okay. it seems like a huge step to me, and that, so I yeah. just always, I had people who I asked for advice from mm -hmm. who I know who are either in my position before or um, and not even just at where I work here at the commission or yeah. I used to work at a university back in New York, but um, elsewhere out in the field who are mm -hmm. colleagues that I can ask advice and things of, but I've never officially said, "Will you be my mentor?" Yeah, that's how do you get yeah. it? How do you do that? Yeah, you, you haven't gone steady. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems like a, a real, yeah, official. That, yeah. And you said you meet with them regularly. Yeah. 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 yeah, I meet with my capital M mentor regularly. With the other people that I consider mentors, and we don't even really use that term, I meet with them a little bit more infrequently as I need them. Hey, I'm having this issue. Can you give me advice? And there's that, you know, kind of a mutual agreement that you know we're, we're working on particular issues so so that's an excellent question and that's why I really strongly recommend looking for a formal program where people have signed up to be mentors and that's what this one is yeah like, that the Army members round table is doing is they're asking for people yeah. to volunteer to be the mentors that's correct, yeah. saying I'm willing to do this and then people who are looking for one and then they get yeah mentors. exactly so with ALA I signed up to be a mentor in the spectrum program and based on it's almost kind of like tinder I guess based on our match <laughs> you know I'll date myself with match uh, they kind of looked at what I wanted a mentee what this specific mentee wanted a mentor and they really just kind of matched us up uh, very well uh, I, I met him in Chicago at ALA he's out of state and uh, yeah we couldn't have picked a better uh, match there uh, so yeah, go through a formal program. If there isn't a formal program near you or accessible to you, you might want to maybe talk to other peers and just say, hey, is there mentoring available? Is anyone willing to be a mentor? And that gets a little bit more difficult, and that really just depends on your situation. I guess you're I, – I, and Krista, you, you asked such a great question. I mean, what is the ask? You know, when you're sitting with somebody and say, would you like to be my mentor – I would just say, if there is no formal program, when you reach out to somebody, I would maybe just say be upfront. I'm looking for a mentor who can provide this. You don't have to meet every single week or anything. It really could be every two months, every maybe even every three months to check in. There is this thing called email that they have nowadays. I think is going to take off, and so it really could just be about touching bases uh, on a regular basis. So I hate to try to give a general answer to base specific situations, but that would be my advice is to be upfront with the person and explain to them why it is you're reaching out and what it is you want. And then if there's, uh, you know, it, it, and I think that avoids the awkwardness if you've been talking to somebody for a couple of times and upside you, mm -hmm. now they feel bad about saying no if, if they just don't have the time. But again, the takeaway there is try to find a formal program. And if there isn't one, demand one. Demand one from your employer, demand one from your state association. 
uh, just look for one because it really is critical to developing uh, the next generation of, of, of workers. Yeah, because someone did ask, there was some previous questions yeah. here, but that actually just relates to what you just said. So I, I work in a public library and can't afford ALA membership. Any recommendations for looking for a free resource? Oh, okay. Or, I mean, That's, I guess you're, you're it would have to be your employer. Yeah, the free resource would be your employer or if you just know a senior member in your local community in your profession that you would be willing to ask because I, I, I'll bet you or your state association, state association like, yeah. see if your local yeah. whoever, wherever you're at um, has something similar and if they don't yeah. um, mm -hmm. I, I bet you that if you talk to somebody in your similar position someone will say oh yeah this person was a huge help to me I mean I, I think within your peer group people will already know you can always talk to somebody about this mm -hmm. um, and maybe you know, more there, yeah yeah even an informal type situation yeah. would work as well. I would think it doesn't have yeah. to be an official, like from one of these situations where we'll match you up and yeah. be all official and I say legal, but that's not really what it means. Yeah. You know, it could be just, hey, this person's great to ask advice of. That's correct, yeah. I did see another question about mm -hmm. smaller library. Lucy uh, asked that question. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so. She says, it seems I'm often told I'll have to move to a smaller institution to move up. Do you think this is good advice? How big of an institution are you at right now? Um, yeah. Good. So there's a question oh, from Lucy. At Duke, library, so. at Duke. Okay, okay, great. Uh, there's a question, and also uh, Allie, we see your question. It's in the queue right now. <laughs> uh, but no, yeah, no, great, great question. And yeah, Duke. I would say Duke is very highly competitive. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I can imagine that opportunities there may be rare and and difficult given just the level of librarians that are there and uh, other professionals. You know, it's good. I'm not gonna say it's bad advice. It is good advice, but it depends. It just it depends. I have been in very small institutions. For example, uh, City College next Strayer, I was the only librarian at my campus. And the good part is that helps you get a lot more responsibility a lot faster. I mean, I was thrown into the deep end of the pool at City College when I got there, uh, and it, I learned a lot on the job. So you get to learn things that normally you would not get if you're in a highly specialized position in a bigger library. The flip side of that is, one, you have no one to help you out. I mean, I was doing things wrong in a lot of areas that I had no one to correct me on. I mean, I wish I would have had someone say, hey, Andrew, this is a better way to do it. This is, you know, this will save you time. Hey, that's not very ethical. Uh, I mean, just to give an example, at City College, I was helping students proofread and edit their papers, which, out of the kindness of my heart, I thought that was just a service that libraries should be providing. And it was finally when I talked to a peer of mine at another campus, she said, well, but that's kind of a minefield because what if they get graded poorly? What if you, you made a mistake on APA style? What if you made a suggestion that the professor doesn't like and the student says, well, he helped me out with it? You know, that's, that's, that's kind of a, it, it's, it's, it's a fine line on there. Other things was I wasn't, I wasn't keeping an accurate gate count. It was probably maybe a more black and white example. Um, so, so, so again, I mean, without getting bogged down into specific examples, there's things that I wish I would have had a little bit more guidance. I also got to learn mark records mm -hmm. inside and out much more than I would have wanted. And if there had been a cataloger, I would have saved a lot of time. You wish you had a cataloger. I wish I would have had a cataloger. So, so again, to, just to, to, to answer and move on to Allie's questions, it, it just it depends. You have to make the decision for yourself. So the benefit of a smaller institution is you get more responsibility. So you'll get noticed. I mean, that's that's a fair point. You'll get you'll get noticed because you know at a younger age, relatively speaking, you've you've had more responsibilities. The flip side is you don't have a lot of people to help you. You also um, may find yourself having less opportunities because let's just say you have a library director above you. If that library director is not going anywhere, you're stuck in your position. No matter how good you are, you're going to have to look outside that organization to get a promotion. Whereas somewhere like Duke. There will be multiple openings at a time. There will be multiple opportunities. There's different leadership. There might be a team leader. There might be uh, someone uh, who supervisor responsibility. There would just be different roles that you can move into. And then also, unfortunately, this is the way it shouldn't work this way, but the way it works. Sometimes, if your end goal is a big institution, uh, they don't always look well upon smaller. They want to see that you've proven that you can do this job at a big institution. I know that one's something I struggled getting to a big university because I had never worked in an institution with more than 10,000 students. Here I am at UNL with 25,000, and I just know that was something I had to talk through because it came up in my interviews. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. I would say definitely weigh those pros and cons. 
and make the best decision you can for yourself in terms of do you want to be in a bigger institution? Do you want to be in a, in a smaller institution? Always making sure that you're looking at your goals and moving towards your goals. Yeah, I think I worked in a, I guess I'd say a medium-sized yeah. university in New York as a Pace University before yeah. I came to Nebraska. Um, and I, it's, 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 it, I guess I consider it smaller. And I, where I started up out as just reference librarians yeah. right at a library school. And in nine years, I was head of reference department, yeah, yeah. which is just one below being the university librarian. Okay. Because that there wasn't a minute, as many people working there. And yeah. It's just that it was a thing that happened, new positions moving up. Um, so if you're talking about, I mean, so I had yeah. three different increasingly higher levels in just nine years because it was a smaller institution. But it, I think what you were just saying, you said earlier about goals, that's what you have to look at first. Mm -hmm. What is your goal? Do you want to be at a bigger university? Yeah. Then maybe you do need to stick it out there. Obviously, something will open up eventually because that's how it works. You yes. come and go. But it may be more difficult because there's so much more going on. People yeah. who are at somewhere and get tenure and are like, I'm here and I'm not moving until I die. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not leaving. That it may be more difficult than in a more medium, more smaller place where mm -hmm. there is more transition and, and chance to. So yeah, yeah, that's absolutely correct. So it's it's good advice, uh, but you take know, it take, take it with a with a grain of salt and apply it to your situation. Do you want to read Allie's question? Yeah, Allie has a. Um, is there any way you can think of to avoid the minefield of problems with having a mentor as your direct supervisor? Um, especially considering a smaller area. Yeah. Basically, sometimes you don't have a choice. Yeah. There is no one else to ask. So how do you? Yeah. Well, I would say the answer is yeah. Don't don't step in that minefield. I mean, it, <laughs> it's like if I if I went to a military area and I saw a sign that said "Won't caution mind," I possibly could tiptoe around it. But you know what? Chances are uh, it's not going to be successful. I I would never ever recommend under any circumstances having. Uh, your supervisor be your capital M mentor. It just it, it just doesn't work out, and many organizations would actually forbid that. Um, now, yeah. because of his or her position, your supervisor is a mentor. Absolutely, your mentors. You know, your I'm sorry. There's different versions. Different of versions. Mentors. Yes. Yeah. There's maybe somebody who yeah. guides you in. I'm your supervisor, and I'm telling you how exactly. you're going to do your job. But then you're talking. Yeah. You were talking about earlier about the. Um, uh, Going to confession, the, the, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The spiritual. It's this person who you can say, "Oh my God, can you yeah. believe what just? Can you tell me what to do about this crazy thing that's going on?" Yes, that's that's outside. absolutely correct. Yeah. So, to use an example of interpersonal conflict, let's just say that I mean this is hypothetical. I'm having a conflict with my colleague. Once I bring it to my chair's uh, attention, who would be let's just say my chair was my mentor. Now that's an actionable item. My chair cannot choose to not hear that. My chair is now aware that there's a conflict between me and a colleague, and she's going to have to take action in some way, shape, or form. It cannot be ignored. Uh, now, that being said, if, you know, so I go see my chair, who is, who does function as a mentor, and I can talk about, um, you know, maybe how I'm handling something. She can give me advice, and she can give me huge advice about the quality of my work, because ultimately, she's the one making decisions on me, especially for those of you in non-academia. I mean, when you really, truly have a relationship where this person can fire you, uh, you know that's kind of the nuclear option, but you want to, you obviously want to listen to that person, and hopefully you have a a, a supervisor, a direct you know a supervisor that you trust and and can tell you okay to do your job better do X Y and Z. So yes, you can you can absolutely look to your supervisor for mentoring. I would just in no way shape or form make that your one single only mentor because there are issues that you're going to want to share with other people who can keep it in confidence. And not be obligated uh, to have to pass it up the chain. Mm -hmm. and I think looking outside, when you're in a small yeah. place, looking outside mm -hmm. your institution, but yeah. it also doesn't have to be because I have my own colleagues all across the country, mm -hmm. technically the world, yeah. that I only communicate with online. Yeah. Facebook group, um, emails, um, Twitter, whatever. And I consider some of them. I guess small and yeah. mentors. So I've never asked any of them officially to be the one. And I have certain people that I go to, and they just happen to be at places around the country. Yeah. You know, get involved in um, social media and see who starts responding to you about things you say, mm -hmm. or reach out to someone that way. It doesn't have to be somebody who works in your university yeah. or even in your town. If you see someone who's doing something similar to you, or someone who you yeah. said a couple steps above you at a similar institution or some kind of place where you want to mm -hmm. be, reach out to them, and they there's. So many people communicate 
just because of the nature of the way the yeah. world is now exclusively online that is a way to have it happen absolutely yeah. and Ali in your specific case uh, you're within a couple of hours from Austin Dallas um, Fort Worth you know, Wake goes about an hour I would recommend you might want to look at uh, and I don't know what type of work you do I don't know if you're you know archives or reference services or instruction but uh, you may want to look for somebody, you know, senior member who's at SMU in Dallas or uh, University of Texas Austin, which obviously, you know, obviously has the library school, so that would be a fantastic place. She's in periodicals. You're in periodicals. I, so I cannot give you any, any names right now or any recommendations, but, you know, you want to look at these bigger universities who are in serials, periodical uh, services, uh, or in a position you want to go to. Maybe that's not where you want to end up being. Maybe you want to be in a different line of work or in an administrative role. And just maybe reach out and, and see if there's anyone you can recommend. Or, uh, if you're a member of TXLA, I would I would recommend going through there. But again, you again you have the benefit of being within a couple of hours of major major metropolitan areas where you have multiple universities and consequently multi, multiple professionals uh, to choose from. So don't be don't be scared to drive um, and just visit because again you're not seeing this person every week. You you, know, you can be seeing this person every two or three months. My mentee, he lives in Illinois right now. He's job hunting. He could end up things in, like Skype calls. Exactly. Yeah, if you want to face-to-face exactly. face thing, yeah, yeah absolutely. Because I will. It could be yeah. months if I ever see my mentee again, uh, you know, at a conference or something, just because we don't even know where he's going to end up living. So, you know, just take advantage of that. And again, Texas, you know, Texas has some outstanding library professionals in there. You definitely have that benefit. Mm -hmm. um, great. And she says, "Very good. Thank you for distinguishing those type of mentor roles." Yes. Yeah, sure. About. All right, now Caitlin has a question, a long thing here. So, it com so when it comes to professional organizations and conferences, do you just sign up and show up? <laughs> is <laughs> yeah. it a good start? Is it good to start going to conferences like State Library Association once pretty early in one's career as like a means to rub elbows with the right people in addition to learning new things? Absolutely. Yes. No, that, oh, thank you for that softball, Caitlin. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you your check. That's, oh, yes. that's the easy one. Okay, then, you know, he, I'll make a distinction, again, between the way the world should work and the way the world does work. Um, it would be great if it was merit-based, and, you know, and, it, and it is. I don't want to be cynical, but it would be great if everything was based on qualifications and the like. But I, I used an example. I was talking to a colleague, an ACRL, for those that aren't familiar, is the Association for college and research libraries. It's a division of ALA, and it's the only reason I'm an ALA member, because it's, you know, it adds up. Those professional dues add up real quick, but uh, ALA is the gatekeeper to ACRL. And I would love to, one of my goals is to be on a committee uh, with ACRL. So I was talking to a colleague of mine, as saying, you know, you know, I want to do X, Y, and Z to be able to get to this goal. And she kind of laughed. And she's like, Andrew, you know how I ended up on these three committees? And I'm like, how? I just knew the person in charge. Like, I knew the chair. <laughs> So, uh -huh. so when you talk about shaking hands, rubbing elbows, absolutely yes. I don't know if this is uh, typical in other professions, but in the library world, coughing mm -hmm. up the money, going to ALA, going to ACRL, going to um, is is uh, Kate, Kate, Kate in Nebraska? She's a, no, uh, at, uh, Fort Bend County Library. Co is that Colorado? Where are you at, Kate? Kate, is that Colorado? Well, if it's called, if, 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 if I think no, Texas. Fort Texas. Texas. Oh, Texas. Texas. Okay, Texas too. a lot of Texans today. <laughs> so TXLA is, is a good one. Absolutely. Absolutely making those connections. I would also, sometimes you might be able to get a little bit of a break if you volunteer to do grunt work. Like uh, I had a colleague, this was in the the, uh, the Texas Distance Library Association. He was not a librarian, he's an instructional designer. For years, he stuffed a lot of packets for mm -hmm. conference. Uh, that's what I was just going to yeah, recommend. Yeah, and he paid his dues. Volunteering to work at yeah. conference. Um, I've done that for Nebraska Library Association. Yeah. Um, and talk about grunt work, when we have our conference here in Lincoln, um, the Library Commission has lots of resources here as far as um, laptops and projectors and a physical AV equipment for all the different conference rooms. So rather than renting them, we are yeah. in charge of that. And I spend my conference when it's here running around from room to room in sneakers and comfy clothes, yeah. just making sure all the technology works. And so people see me and know me. I didn't do it for that yeah. reason. I did it because it was something we could do. But um, yeah, definitely getting involved in conference. That's one thing that my dad taught me. My dad was in, um, that's in New York, where I'm from, State University of New York. He was in central administration, so education. And he said, it's not always what you know, it's who you know. That's absolutely correct. And it's yeah. just, yes, getting out there and just having your face, just being there. Yeah. Um, maybe being a little. Um, Brave, for some people this is brave, 
submitting a conference session proposal yeah. and presenting on something you're doing. For some people, that is a a, a scary proposition, sitting yeah. in front of a room of 30, 40, 50, whoever knows how many people, but um, just get your name on something and then suddenly people will see, you know, yeah. and you have something you can also bring and say, exactly. so I was presenting on this topic and I know you're interested in it too. It starts, yeah. start small. Like I, I, I mentioned it earlier, joining these organizations is expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you can't do ALA right now, focus on TXLA. I think everybody needs to join their state one. If, if it's a financial sacrifice, I would just put it on your budget as just a professional necessity. You know, you just you just need it. That 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 to me, if there's one uh, group you're going to join, it's your state association, and start looking for small little committees. Because again, when you apply for a committee, they're going to ask you. There's going to be a question that says, "What previous experience do you have?" And if you said, "Hey, I was stuffing envelopes here. I greeted people there. I helped uh, with the website. I helped with the Twitter handle." They're going to see that you're active. You're not just trying to put a line on your resume. They're going to see that hey, you 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 put in the sweat. And you know the blood into the uh, this organization, and like uh, Krista was saying, give those presentations. If you don't want to speak, be up there in front of a possibly future bosses, which you should think of them as. Think of them as future bosses. You know, if this person will interview me, uh, what's going to happen? It start with a poster poster presentation. Session, yeah. Poster yeah. session. Poster session. Yeah, you know, three minutes, uh, three to five minutes. The poster presentation. You say that over and over again, and it's a good way to get your toe in the water. Uh, there mm -hmm. might also be lightning rounds. But, but yeah, definitely yes. So the, so the answer to the question is an easy yes. Be involved in professional organizations because that's the only way you're going to accomplish the goal of moving up. And see if potentially your institution will support you in that monetarily. Yeah. And it does vary. And I know it is yeah. changing um, day to day to some organizations. Um, here at the Library Commission, where I work at, um, we pay our own membership fees, but the commission will pay our um, registration fee for conference. Mm -hmm. So yeah. up to whatever the member rate is, and there are grants. There's a give or yeah. take. Oh, that's there are yeah, grants scholarships. And scholarships. Yeah. scholarships. Yeah, here yes. in Nebraska, we have some of our regional systems and NLA, and um, we give grants to a professional grant. Professional yeah. development grants to attend conferences. Yeah. Um, look for them and get someone else that a grant. Yeah. ALA. Yeah. If you want to be active with ALA, they, they, they have a lot of scholarships uh, for new people, for uh, diversity, for some. They even have scholarships for mid career librarians. I mean, you know, they really, ALA offers mm -hmm. a lot of support for different stages. I'm going to a conference next April in San Antonio, by the way. Uh, so I'll be down at, at the Riverwalk, which is my, one of my favorite places. Uh, they uh, the uh, the conference gives every every it's every it's biannual, so it's every two years. They give a scholarship to a first time presenter uh, oh, every nice. conference. So you know, if you're a first time presenter, if you're new to the profession, look for those kind of scholarships because uh, there are a lot of organizations that recognize that. I I got a grant for uh, the Mid Plains Library Association. Which Texas is not a member of, but I'm a member of that group, and you know, they uh, they do the Midwest here in the a little bit of the West, and I I was able to get a $500 scholarship to attend um, ACRL, and that helped me a lot. That combined with an ACRL scholarship funded me. If not, I would not have been able to go. And let me tell you, ACRL was a great experience for me. That's a big one of the big ones. For an in for but that was a huge yeah. person, university yeah. college people. Definitely. Exactly, exactly. Okay, there, even if you're not a research institution, it's your peaks. So yeah. Yeah. We have about 10 minutes left if anyone has any more. These have been very good questions. Glad I can answer them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. Maybe to, uh, just to kind of fill the, uh, the silence here so hopefully somebody answers. One thing that's emerged here as I'm hearing some of these questions and the like, and you know, there was a question about the smaller organization, questions about networking, questions about meeting people at conferences. One big piece of advice that I would give is no matter what, Focus on the current job you have I and mean, keep an eye to the future. You want to know where this is going, but if you do your current job well, opportunities are just going to present themselves. You know, people will see you doing a really good job as an entry level person and they'll know, hey, I can count on that person to do, to do this other thing. So that, that goes far and that goes for professional organizations. If you're doing, if you're stuffing um, uh, bags, be the best bag stuff for there is. I mean, just be the best because those are those soft intangibles that people will recognize. Because if you go, if you, for example, let's just say you're stuffing bags because you want to be the chair of a committee one day, you know, five years down the road. If you're just be doing a lazy, lackadaisical job and you're just stuffing them and you're putting things in the wrong order, 
people are going to know that as soon as you don't consider a job to be worthy of your time, you're not going to do it well. As opposed to, again, if you're just stuffing those bags, if you're putting that much time and attention into something so trivial, you're going to put time and attention into something that's important. So again, you're, you're always on stage, especially in today's, I know this is a cliche and it's trite, but in today's day and age of social media and you're a Google search away from being discovered, you want to make sure that you've, you've made a positive impression on every single person that you've met, everybody who has seen you, because there's a lot more people looking at you than you realize. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that sort of might relate to that question. Um, Mackenzie wants to know, I've been an ML, MLIS degree yeah. paraprofessional for nine years mm -hmm. and have been feeling stuck. Yeah. Any advice for what to do during the tip four? Mackenzie, can, can you tell me what you do, Mackenzie? Can you uh, put in the chat box what job you have? I mean, without specifics necessarily, but maybe what type of, type of work. Access services. Okay, yeah. access service manager. Of course, I have to be an area I know nothing about. Um, <laughs> but it's tip four. But it's, it, yeah, it's tip four is, um, is go, sorry, good, good advice here. Okay, so you're a manager, so stick to the plan. Okay, that's, I, I would probably say, plan of what you're yeah, that's, that for be flexible comes into play. You have to make a decision for yourself. I don't know your family. I don't know what your goals are. I don't know how happy you are in your specific city. I just I don't know those things. You you're the only one that knows those things, and you need to really determine how important is this to me. I see life as a pie chart, uh, and job is a big part of that pie, but it shouldn't be the most important thing. And you have to weigh that against the rest of that pie. Uh, again, you know, it, do you want to move and look elsewhere? Do you uh, do you need a particular salary, etc.? And the only tip I can give is, you know, that one is one is determine what you want to do. Two, look at your plan. If you haven't created one, I mean, you, 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 if you're an access service manager and, and you have nine years of experience post MLIS, you've You've That's had a plan, thing. yeah, you just maybe don't realize, but maybe take the time after this to, to write it down, kind of like what I did, connect the dots, see what you develop, and see if there's anything in your area or, or anywhere you're willing to go that offers those opportunities. You know, maybe catalog your skills. Um, you may have, you may be an excellent manager of time. Mm -hmm. uh, you may uh, have technical skills that maybe are, are separate from your job, but just essentially, just, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right choice of words, but essentially create an inventory. That's the term I was looking for, an inventory of who you are, what skills you bring to the table, and then maybe, if need be, look at what else you can do. Maybe you, there are a lot of graduate certificates now. A lot of iSchools offer 12 credit graduate certificates, you know, if you want to switch gears or you want to develop a new skill. Uh, if that's out of your budget or out of your, your means, you also might want to look at Coursera. You might want to look at edX. There's a bunch of other um, uh, platforms that offer what they're, they're called micro degrees now or micro credentials, where it'll be a lot less expensive than a university would. And and again, and just reassess your plan. Just you know, where are you with your plan? What stage of life are you in? And what can I do? And then kind of go back. Sometimes these things are not sequential. Go back to step one and create a new set of goals. So you've been, yeah, you've been you in it. Yeah, started. exactly. Um, depends on what do you mean by feeling stuck? Oh. Are you unable to advance where you're working at or are you just kind of bogged down in this, the plan that I did have and the job that I'm working towards, it turns out it's not really for me. I mean, it depends on what you mean by what, yeah. are, you, what are you stuck at in, in that. You have your Fraser hat on. Yeah. I mean, you have like the Fraser radio show. But now that is a good question, Mackenzie. If you wouldn't mind sharing uh, maybe, you know, without disclosing anything personal, what exactly you mean by stuck? I'd be able to give you more specific That's, advice. Um, Unable to advance your able to advance, okay. yeah. Okay, then my advice there is, obviously it sounds to me, if you have gone as far as you can in your current job, question one would be, is there another line at your institution that you can transfer over to? Uh, it may not even have to be the library world. Uh, I know I had to leave the library world full time for a few years. Because again, my, I was able to demonstrate how my skills are transferable. In that case, it was research and assessment skills. And if not, then you know what? We all hit the crossroads. If you're able yeah. to advance to the job where you're at, yeah. then you definitely you may need to look for a job in a different institution. A different yeah, exactly. Look at a different institution. Um, and if you want, if you want specific money. specific advice, maybe reach out to me. Uh, but if you have my email address, and I can, you know, we can talk about your personal sort of circumstances, but. Yeah, you have to make that decision. Is it time to move on? 
Or let's just say that you live in a town that you absolutely love. You have your church there, your civic organizations, your family, your friends. You know, your work isn't everything. If you have this level of happiness that this whole, again, this pie chart is giving you, are you willing to maybe accept the fact that your career path wasn't what you wanted or, or is it, you know, maybe it is, but your, your work is an important part of your job. And I'm definitely the philosophy be, if you don't like what you're doing, kind of like what, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Steve Jobs in a Stanford commencement speech from 20, uh, 2005. If, if, if you're not loving what you do, then you've got to find something else. That's easier said than done because, again, you might have a spouse, you might have kids, and I don't know that you do or not, but yes. sure, look, for, look for something you love. I know that was a little general there. Yeah, that's hard, yeah. And then Allie has a great question. Yeah. Allie, well, this will be since we're just hitting about yeah. 10 be the last one. This will be our last one we'll do for today. Um, what is your opinion of online study library schools, and which one do you think is better than the others? <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you asked. I went to Drexel and I did my degree online. I uh, I would not have been able to get my library degree if it hadn't been uh, available online, uh, just because of my time and my, my the stage of my life where I was at. This so so I would say the online schools are good. I mean, there are several programs. The University of Washington. There's uh, uh, I think she, um, Urbana Champagne offers. I might be wrong about that, but I know they have some online components. Uh, Drexel definitely does. Uh, I would definitely look for a reputable institution, and luckily we have ALA accreditation on top of uh, regional accreditation. So they, you know, ALA is definitely certifying that this is a good program. So I, I and then I'm an online learning librarian, so I obviously cannot dismiss online education right beyond the job. Uh, so high schools are good in terms of choosing the right one. You have to look at your situation. I love Drexel, but if I could go back, I would not have gone to Drexel because Drexel was not the right curriculum for me. I did not know that at the time, and part of that insight has been because of the way my, my life has taken. Uh, I would recommend Drexel if you have any interest in being an e-librarian and being uh, like digital, uh, digital archiving, uh, healthcare. Drexel is the best in the country. Healthcare, informatics, and the like, outstanding. If you wanted to be a legal librarian or the like, University of Washington has an outstanding online law librarian program. Uh, Chapel Hill, I don't know, if they, I don't think they have much of an online component, but there, I would say Chapel Hill, Michigan, Urbana Champaign are the best for academic librarians, just because they teach you how to research. Which let me tell you, others do not. I had three credits of research in, in library school, and that did not prepare me for my job. So the quality of online education is good. Pick the one that works best for you and, and ask, talk to the advisors, look at the curriculum, find alumni from those programs, tell them what it is you want to do, and they can give you candid replies. Because again, if you were asking me whether Drexel was the right one for you, again, I would say yeah, what it, it would depend on what you're doing. And if you describe your job to me, I can give you a really fair assessment of whether Drexel is good, uh, good or not. And I will warn you, at the time that I went to Drexel, it was $1,000 per credit hour. It has only gone up, so that's something worth considering is the cost of it. So if you have a good regional or state um, school that is offering a library program, you really should look at that because that will be the least expensive unless you're able to get a scholarship, which in that case, sky's the limit. Um, and you were mentioning ALA accreditation. Don't just go to any fly-by-night. ALA actually has, I just searched online library master's yeah. home. They have a searchable database of all the ALA accredited library um, mm -hmm. programs, yeah. and you can search by, I was just looking at it now, by particular university, if you know when you're interested, and you can search by state, and then you can limit it to online only programs, a mixture of online yeah. and person, okay. and then specializations, if you are specifically one. I didn't know that existed, I'm looking at it, I did not know that existed, <laughs> and I would definitely recommend that. FSU, I forgot to mention FSU, FSU in Tallahassee is excellent, and their online them and Drexel partner, they're excellent, so there's a lot of good options. If it, yeah, if it, I cannot think of one on top of my head, but if there is no, if, if, if there's not an LA, if it's not ALA accredited, forgive me, it, it, I, you send me your $30,000, I will just <laughs> print out on a Word document, I will print out a degree and it'll be worth just as much, but I don't know of any fly-by-night library schools. There are a lot of fly-by-night schools in other fields, especially in yeah. business, but I, I don't know of one in library schools. I think any library school you find will be good, whether it's the, the, a good one for you is the question. Mm -hmm. North Texas, I mean, I'm looking at this list now, now all this is coming up to me. So the University of North Texas is excellent, especially if you want to be a school librarian or public librarian. 
Uh, FSU is also excellent, especially for technical skills. Drexel is excellent for technical skills uh, and digital research and definitely informatics. Um, and then University of Washington is wonderful for those who want to go down a more legal path and be a law librarian. Although I'll warn you, most law librarian jobs require a law degree. So you have yeah. to weigh whether three years and $200,000 of your life is, is worth it given the income that you'll, you'll get. Oh, Ellie says her grandfather is a professor at FSU. Fantastic. Oh, go. great, Ellie. There you go. So you, you have it in. You're a, le you're a legacy student. Okay. Well, well, anyway, thank you all so much. We're out of time, but this is not the end of the conversation. You have my information. Yes. And, yeah. Nice. Yeah, there it is. And tell the other 30 people that didn't show up uh, <laughs> that they missed out. But I'm here. I really, again, given the amount of mistakes I've made and given how frustrating some stages of my life has been, uh, I really want to help others avoid that path. So feel free. Uh, to reach out to me and I'll help you in any way I can or yeah, at least point you in the right direction. Great. All right. Thank you Andy, very much. That was awesome. I think hey. you got a lot of good info yeah. and a lot of questions answered that um, I and everyone else had. Okay. Great. All right. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, let me escape over there again. I'll get out of the slides and I'm going to All right, hey, look, that's our library community yeah. website. Um, all right, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Okay. Encompass Live into the search there. Um, Encompass Live, luckily so far in the world, um, nothing else has called itself Encompass Live. <laughs> Yay for us. Um, so if you are, of course, it doesn't do it right. Um, looking for us, you can Google and find um, our website. <clears throat> Um, and this is working. There we go. Uh, and it will is also beyond all the information that you get from me as well. So this is our current um, sessions. Um, the show has been recorded and will be here in our archives. This is our main page. This is where all of our upcoming shows. But our recording will be over here where we have all of our other ones. Here's last week's, um, which is also UNL people. Hey. Yeah, um, <laughs> then, you know, we're down, right down the street. Yeah, so. it's easy to so a link to recording and the presentation, the new up-to-date presentation yes. that Andrew sent. Yeah, we'll send today that. Yeah, will be available there. All of you who attended today and anyone who pre-registered will get an email from me later um, this afternoon, and that is available and ready. Um, so that will be up there for you. Um, I hope you'll join us next time when our topic is um, the solar eclipse. Did you know there's a solar eclipse coming? And the breast is one of the best places to see it. It's yeah. getting cut right through the middle, which is yeah. kind of great. Um, from corner to corner, um, it is coming through. So um, Mary Sowers, who is our government information services librarian here, will be on with us to um, talk about things that libraries are doing in Nebraska, at least related to the um, eclipse. We um, actually ordered 3,000 uh, eclipse glasses that are being distributed to li the library commission. Did They're being distributed to libraries across the state. There's lots of other um, programs and things going on. She's got a librarian from Seward Moore. Library, make a vibe be with her, and she's working on getting some other people along as Great. well. So, if you want to find out what you can do at your library, if you don't already have something planned, it's only coming up another month. Yeah. Um, but you still have time. And if you're if you're looking to come to Nebraska, to Western Nebraska, to camp, uh, um, it's probably too late. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's probably too late because uh, Nebraska really is on an ideal path, and and, and we have a very rural western half of the state, which mm -hmm. is going to be full of campers. And tense in the next few weeks. Yeah, unless you can find someone who's willing to let you sit in their yard. Exactly. Yeah. Go to Airbnb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's um, I'll show our show for next week. So please do sign up for that and any of our other ones we have coming up. I'm always adding. Here's August. It's almost full. You'll see new topics coming in. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. We have a Facebook page there. So if you're a big Facebook user, we'll get there eventually. Um, you can pop over there. So you had a reminder today. Um, don't forget to log in today's show. Um, when our recordings are available, I post them on here. When new shows are upcoming, um, added to the schedule, I post them on here. So if you are um, big on Facebook, to do go over there and give us a like. Other than that, that wraps up for today's show. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, yeah, Andrew. Sure. For Thank you, Krista. Thank you, for joining sure. us today. No worries. <laughs> and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.